past or the fact that the constitutional constitution is incapable of of providing the framework for that. Uh, perhaps Tim Baker, others also, um, the white lawyers appearing in the human rights cases. Um, can a white judge understand a black conception of the rule of law or a, a, a misunderstanding? The, to all the panelists, uh, the thing that is right before us these days, does section 25, the property clause, have to be amended? And if so, um, how exactly? And then to the abolitionists, um, abolition always sounds like a, an exciting project to me. But <laughs> but have we reached and the building the building something bigger? But uh, can we have a peek into that future? What is it that we are busy doing? Ab ab abolishing? You know, when we abolish slavery, the past, the future is no slavery. And when we abolish the death penalty, the future is no death penalty. If we work towards abolishing the constitution as a document or the constitutional order, uh, do we have any idea at this stage as to where that will be going? But I start with Judge de Khan was the next. I'm not going to be long. I'll use the time actually to uh, express my excitement. I was young, I was revolutionary, and I wanted to break everything around me and change my world. And if you went so, I would have been deeply disappointed. I would have walked out there and feel a bit older. So I'm excited. I agree, no biblical uh, veneration, I agree, no <clears throat> assumption that 1994 was a total apocalyptic moment in our lives. I agree that you constantly must ask. It's not new I was saying to you, and not so long ago. It's Fanon who reminded us, didn't it? The great thing can revolutionary. Every generation, you know the codes, don't you? Hmm? Every generation must really define its mission and either betray it or fulfill it. So your duty is not to betray your mission. You've got to define it as well and as clear as you can. I did. I said to Tim Baker, in my tradition, I always said the land is ours. And when Tom and Baker does contortions about whether or not resolutions of, the, of his movement are correct or not, it's a very interesting conundrum that you find yourself in, which could have been overcome essentially by dealing with landlessness in the last 25 years. The second one I want to leave you with, <coughs> too many of I beg your pardon, <coughs> too many issues to deal with and very little time. The second question is, is that the constitution is all of the things that we say at a metaphysical level and other jurisprudential levels. If you ask me, have been lived this long, have you seen our revolution falter? Our revolution has faltered. I know it's people. It's leaders, it's dedication to the high values that have led us over the years. We must resolve the land question, we must resolve challenges around equality, we, we must indeed search for integrity, for hard work, for openness, for a notion of achievement, not displacing our duty and passing it on to other people. And I'm saying these are very important values because the paper eat it or spit it on which the constitution is. But ultimately, it's us who are going to go out there and plant trees and build new towns, new cities, and, and destroy pit toilets and find land, destroy landlessness, and restore rightful ownership of land, and so on. But that can happen in fuzzy rooms where people have reorientated their attention not the values that should reconstruct our society. About age, of course age will have something to do with it. We don't want to desecrate everything we need. We fought a long, hard struggle, and we think we've achieved something. Not everything, but we've certainly achieved a lot. And some of us who spent all our lives fighting colonialism and to reverse its excesses, don't accept that nothing happened. 
Was it perfect? Of course not. Clearly not. But we, we mustn't be our lawyers and alike and beyond, constitutionalism and beyond, caused us into life. We need, I had lunch the other day with the uh, ambassador of Singapore. He says, you know, Justice, I've been reading your judgments, I've read your book, I've read your papers and things, but let me tell you something. I don't think Africa can afford democracy. And they gave me a book of their leader in Singapore. So it may be that the uh, abortionists should really be thinking about how to find effective ways of changing society without trampling on the most valuable part. Rule of law, Tembega, must stay. We can't play in a jungle again. We can't pretend that we could do good and justice and, and, and reconstruct society when it's a free for all. However radical our views are, we need norms, we need rules, we, and we, we ought to improve them as we move on. So as we deconstruct, as we decolonize, it must be within a systematic thoughtful and humane sense. I reject the notion, for instance, that some part of South Africans ought not to be here at all. I think, I think uh, our humanism requires that we have an open-ended notion, even about race, and its importance and place. Identify hurt, demand apologies, demand reparation, do all those good things. But in the end, we have to embrace an open-ended hum humanity. Otherwise, we're doing what our oppresses and what colonialism sought to achieve. So in short, I, I don't want to change. I think younger people should be more radical than us. I think they should be. But I think we should keep the rule of law. I think we should find high-end values that make our society better. And at the end of every radical position, we should ask the final question that Lenin famously asked, what's to be done? At the end of every deliberation, conversation, contestation, what's to be done? How do we get water to the people? How do we stop managers from stealing money that they ought to guard and protect and prevent from going away? How do we build new cities as we expand? How do we clear peri urban land hunger? Those are the real, how do we choose leaders? Indeed, how do we hold them accountable? So I would like to see a holistic jurisprudence around what would move Africa from the devastation of colonialism to a new space of, of humanism and inclusivity. Thank you. Of being transformative 
But certainly, it depends on the will of the people and what people do. Secondly, as far as the authoritarian regimes are concerned, of course you say China is wonderful, but they come here and they bring their own labor. They are not interested in the transformation of our society at all. And there are many arguments about China, and I don't want to get there. I agree that some authoritarian regimes can be good, but many are corrupt, and I think that the answer lies somewhere else. So we've got to look at that very, very carefully. As far as language is concerned, our constitutional court has ruled in the Stellenbosch case that their language policy is perfectly fine and that the abolition of Afrikaans is okay. So things have gone both ways. As far as working towards the decolonized South Africa is concerned, I just do not be careful to see what that decolonization means. If you look at the clothes that everyone was talking about, who was talking about decolonization was wearing, you might get a very interesting idea of what I mean. So let me practical, let me trick forward, let's say precisely what we mean by decolonization. So there are three debates. The one is, can the constitution cut it if everyone acts properly and the government does its work or not? Does the constitution need amendment? We've got to discuss that more and more. And what are those amendments that are required? And please, abolitionists, tell us how and what. It is easy. Everybody who criticizes the constitution today has got one weakness. Nobody has said in real terms, I will take out this and put this in its place. Nobody has said, I mean, if you want to say, abolish the constitution, abolish all laws, and let's have a free for all in society to achieve change, have the guts to say it. Say what you want to put in its place. Thank you very much. Perhaps not. But if you, if, but if you have it, uh, let me explain. 
Uh, and this is, again, for Lulu, so the third time I'm explaining the same thing. What had happened is, in March 1909, because the book is a largely historical account, March 1909, there was a big dispute in Swaziland about land. Now the way the colonists occupied the land, uh, the bulk of my book is about the, how the land was lost. So the way the, the, the colonists took the land in Swaziland was a combination of strategies. So there was one pure conquest, in other words, they occupy, they fight and they win. But the other was what was called concessions. In other words, they would negotiate contracts and sign a list of a limited period. For the most part in Swaziland, those leases were about 10 years. And they were signed with a king called Mbadzen. But over time, when the leases ran out, the colonists refused to release the land back to the Swazis. And they came with different strategies of trying to retain the land. So a lease would mutate from a temporary arrangement into a permanent arrangement. So it was one of the strategies for the colonial uh, conquest. In 1909, a little known chief in Swaziland convenes a meeting of his community in order to protest against this practice of the migration of land from contracts to ownership. And in that meeting, he makes a speech, it's a long speech, and the purpose of the meeting, I mean, uh, I must c congratulate uh, 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 Dr. Modiri um, in part for his input today because it really gets one thinking because it's such a considered response to constitutional supporters like me. But one of the points he makes is the sort of bias in my book towards the Congress tradition, which is something I've embraced. So what happens in Swaziland, which is most fascinating, is that this chief says to his people, the way in which we are going to address this problem of the migration of these contracts, we've been defeated in war, and we know what had happened in South Africa, and that's, again, uh, as someone who's read the book, you'd know the story. Thus, I put these four contexts, the Eastern Cape context, the KwaZulu context, the Transvaal context, and the Free State context. And ultimately, what they boil down to is that if you came to South Africa in 1890, the options of war were over for African people. They were defeated in war. The Kosa people ultimately resorted to national suicide because they were unable to find answers to the question of colonial conquest. <laughs> the same thing happened in Swaziland. By 1909, the Swazis had been defeated in war, not by the British, but by the Boers. But the British came later with the Alfred Milner. So, the chief says to his people, the way to deal with this is that we should make representations to the British government. And this idea of, British, of representations to the British government was an idea that was embedded in South African historiography. Every African group started with representations, petitions, delegations, deputations. This has been construed uh, 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 sometimes as a sign of weakness as a sign of the ultimate acceptance of conquest. But I tried to understand black people from a different perspective. What if actually they had no options in the light of the colonial aggression? So that's the setting. But towards the end of his speech, and I quoted a bit of the speech, he then says, we believe that this is being done to us because we are African. But we do not care. They can take the land, but the land is ours. It's put in quotation marks. Third paragraph of page 281. It then migrates to the cover of the book. So this thing about marketing is really nonsense. It's, I mean, it's truly nonsense, really. It doesn't deserve a response. And then, can I also talk to the other comrade here who was talking about changes. I think it's the comrade sitting here. You know the problem? <coughs> Big changes in history do not happen overnight. They are incremental and they are difficult. Everywhere you go, Germany today is still 
dealing with the problem of fascism. They are still paying reparations as a consequence of what had happened in Auschwitz, 1939, 1933, 1936. New claims are still being processed. When I did the research, I, uh, I, I gave the Steve Beagle lecture this year at Forte. And it was based on this idea of a crime against humanity. But my research shows that as at 2018, new claims are emerging from the German gassing of people at Auschwitz. So, in large historical terms, apartheid is still a new thing. And dealing with apartheid in historical terms is a new thing and a new phenomenon. Today, universities like Harvard, Yale, Virginia, are having to grapple with consequences of slavery. In England, large corporations, the Peter Stuyvesants, the Rothmans, are having to grapple with the consequences of the founders having founded those companies as a consequence of slavery. So we have to look at history in broad historical terms. We are not alone, comrades. We are not alone in the world. We are not alone in suffering in the world. But that simply shows that we must understand the large historical context in which we are functioning. That does not mean we should accept the status quo. We should question the status quo all the time. But we should understand that human suffering is not only in Southern Africa. And Okay, um, the judge has said two things. I'll tell you what he has said. The first is, that's very true. <laughs> the second is, you must stop. <laughs> I accept the first. <laughs> I must make the last point, because I think it's truly, truly important to make this point, because it's an answer to you, uh, Judge Van States. It's the linkage between this idea of decolonization and whether or not, in my belief, white judges can understand black suffering, right? What do I think? So there's a comrade who says, should we go back to decolonization? There is the problem in the very formulation of the question. Decolonization is something going back 